Hello? Oh, yes. Is uh, Ali, Eric, and... Uh, you're supposed to be backstage. You, you, you're part of this panel. Okay. And while he's coming up, let me introduce the rest of the panel. We have, um, at first I just want to say, I thought that was really a lovely movie, and I had seen it before. The first time I saw it, it didn't, I, I didn't really connect with it as much. And someone said, the difference is the Eberfest audience. Nail said that this audience is so good to see a movie with because you really accept, you're so open and receiving about the, the movies. And I know that that really did make a difference yesterday when I was watching Departures because I could feel how the audience was with it and, and watching the, uh, the dressing or encoffinment of the bodies, it was such a beautiful process. And I could almost feel the breath of the audience. And I know that helped Departures for me. Okay, I think he's up here. Let's bring out Nail Minnow as the moderator of the panel. And again, Grace Wang, our, one of our FARC One correspondents. Lisa Rothman, our official blogger. And our other FARC One correspondent, Ali Arakan. heard about this movie was uh, when Rogers sent the email sent, oh, I put you on this panel discussion. This movie that I thought, you know, it seems like it's up your alley. So I thought, okay, let me check out what you wrote about it. And I read probably, I went read past the first sentence of the review and I wrote him back. I said, okay, that's fine. I, I would love to be on the panel. Um, so I just want to read that first sentence, which I think so perfectly so described this movie. Um, he says, I capture the castle as a kind of novel dreaming adolescent curl up with on a rainy Saturdays, imagining themselves as members of a poor but brilliantly eccentric family living in a decrypt English castle, which in my opinion is, is probably the charm of this movie. Um, so I, I really, really liked it, and I, I felt that there was this sort of sense of melancholy throughout the film. It almost sort of makes you want to languish in it, and um, it's a really lovely quality, and I thought in that sense the film really succeeded. Um, another thing I loved was um, the character of Cassandra. I thought it was refreshing to have a young female character in the film that is not um, completely nonsensical and head over heels when it comes to love. Like he act she actually knows what she wants and she's not willing to um, settle or change her moral values um, and give up you know, finding out what she wants until she actually has it. And I thought that was refreshing. That's, yeah, that's what I, um, I don't love this movie. Be a little um, I, I mean, I, I just because I, I have the exact opposite response to that first sentence that you did in certain ways, but um, I do actually think it's an important movie because we don't remember anymore that women can have a moment where they collect themselves and respond to things and figure out their feelings before they go ahead and, and just end up being the object of other people's love. And this movie is really about an actual adolescence, which you know, we don't really remember, we don't remember what that is anymore. Like, girls go from being 11 to 22 in our culture, basically, in terms of how they present themselves. So, in this way, this movie to me is like, was actually kind of a revelation. I forgot what it was like to have a teenage, like, have adolescents who just sit around and read books and watch things, you know? Well, that's exactly it, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a bathos film, it's build up so far. And, uh, um, you know, when you were growing up as well, it wasn't necessarily it wasn't necessarily the melancholy or the, or the pathos that people see. It, it was it was 
kind of dull, and it was kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, you tried to make choices, but choices were being made for you. Um, and uh, I, I actually liked this movie a lot, and I saw it when it first came out in, in London, and I'm in the same kind of mindset uh, as I was when I first saw it as well, so it's, it's working for me again. Um, but uh, something else that, I, that, 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 that I was struck by was this, you know, this writer's block thing. And, 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 and I thought this was, it, it was very interesting to, to, to program uh, this film now. But obviously, so many people were involved in writing about film and blogging about film and, and writing film itself. Um, that I thought this might be a brilliant um, double book with adaptation, you know? <laughs> It would be perfect. You've got you've got the siblings. You've got you know writing and and, and, and writers block and maybe not one after the other, but definitely the same way. Um, I had an experience that I've had um, often before. This was my second time seeing the film. My first time, I had a hard time letting go of the book, and my second time, I came into it more willing to just look at the movie within its own terms. I have to say, I don't think that the movie is as good as the book, and I encourage everyone to read the book. Part of what makes the book so vivid and so charming, exactly what Grace said, is this uh, uh, the, the, the narrator's voice. It's very internal to her, and of course, that's the hardest thing in the world to adapt into a book. And so, there are things that I think are very powerful in the book that don't work as well in the film. But I was able, as I said, to let go of that a little bit and enjoy the film in its own terms. Um, but I can see that, uh, or I can sense from the audience that some people did not like it. Now, of course, it does have a very unexpected ending. We expect, we are we are raised to expect, I think it's in the lizard brain to expect, that when you have a movie that has got beautiful, poor English daughters and handsome, wealthy American boys, that, you know, some stuff's going to happen. And um, and it doesn't it doesn't work out that way. Uh, well, it's a, it's a first love, is it? I think, I think I, you know, even when I first saw it as well, I thought that you know, she's not going to end up with any of these guys. Um, be, you know, um, because, thank you. Um, I'll pay you later. Um, and, um, you know, she's not going to end up with any of these guys because I think it was, it was structured in such a way that she was, it was her first love. And, and essentially, she's writing, a, she's writing a lifestyle blog anyway. So, you know, oh, I went there, and then, you know, uh, and then I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, uh, Simon looked at me, and I looked at him, and we kissed, and it was great, and, you know, uh, leave your comments. Um, well, no, it's just, I mean, this, with the, with the, I mean, I think fundamentally the, the idea that it's more important to be able to love than to be, you know, to be in love is, an, is a really important concept, and how often do you actually see that in the film? Like, there's, you know, the... Yeah, it's a it's it's a muscle like learning how to really love. It's an action, and this, and it's about sacrifice and acknowledging other people as as real as yourself. And to me, that's the incredible part of the movie. Actually, I think I'm talking to myself into liking it. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there's a lot of sacrifice in the movie. There's a lot of giving in the movie, and also a lot of heartbreak. And and I you know and I think that, that was well conveyed. And I also want to just take a moment and say how beautiful I thought the performance was. So Tara, the wonderful Tara Fitzgerald, she should just be in every movie as far as I'm concerned. She played Topaz, and I thought she was just marvelous. And uh, Romola Gary, who was Cassandra, I thought was terrific. And how about the boy from E.T.? He's the Negro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just on that note, I, I really thought the film, um, even though at first it seemed to be just sort of teenage love affair, you know, with some sort of life lesson, I thought there were some, like you said, some really important life lessons. Uh, one is you mentioned the capacity of love. I think it's important for um, the teenagers to, to see this, but then something like the notebook, you know, where it's, you actually develop and you go through life and things don't always turn out perfect and you might not end up happy ever after, but it's not a waste. And it's nice to go through that. Um, another thing I thought was interesting was sort of the contrast between two sisters, um, Rose and Cassandra. And I thought, to me, it kind of, like, there was this interesting interaction between intentions and actions. You know, I mean, like, they both want to find love, but um, Rose sort of took the traditional, I'll, I'll, I'll get it any way I can, yeah. and she got certain results that she didn't particularly like. And Cassandra, on the other hand, said, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait till it comes to me in the way that I want it to. And in the end, she didn't get what she wanted either, but it was a different 
kind of result. And I think she got more out of the process than Rose did, even though eventually Rose ended up happy ever after. I don't know if she actually learned anything out of it. Well, both, she, of them, you know? both of them felt like caretakers of the family, too. Both of them, they had the, they had the mother who died, they had the father who was not capable of taking care of anybody. And in their own way, both of them were trying to take care of the family. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what, what I'd like to do is, I'd like no, to... I'd just like to say okay. one thing. Uh, there's a reason she's called Cassandra, obviously, yeah. because of, you know, uh, because of pre and there's obviously that she can see what's going on, but she can't tell anyone, you know, no, no one would believe her. And then there's a, uh, I think it was, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, um, uh, it, it, it's one of those, you know, the, the kind of 1920s, 1930s, you know, girl fiction, you know, written for girls by, by, you know, women kind of thing, and, uh, and, and you have that in, in English literature, kind of, uh, 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 you know. And um, uh, I'd like to read the book. Now. I'd like to read the I, book. I really recommend it. Um, the book was written in 1948, but of course set before World War II. Yeah. What I'd like to do is I'd like to hear some thoughts and questions from the audience, but I particularly want to start by hearing from someone who did not like the movie, because I heard some rumblings out there of people who did not like it. Does anybody out there want to want to speak up? Okay, we got a microphone. I agree with, with, with what most of you said. I mean, uh, uh, I really had a, I had trouble with the film. Uh, I was rubbing my head the whole time. I can under, but um, the lady in pink. I'm sorry, I forgot your your name. But you okay, raised an interesting. <laughs> you raised an interesting point. I think I'll have to see it again because the way you mentioned that uh, we've forgotten what adolescence is like, and we uh, we just forget that moment where we're learning about how to deal with love. And uh, I never really looked at it from that point. I was just taking a look at the story. But I couldn't buy all of the motivations by some of the characters, how the conflicts were set up. But when you bring the point of, from her point of view, how is she going to deal with these conflicts, regardless whether they're real or not, I'd probably have to take a look at that again. So I, I just appreciate you bringing that, bring up that point. One, wait, sorry, one thing I just want to say is I feel like the hats in this film need their own round of applause. And, um, As a mother of a theatrical costume designer, I thank you. Well, I mean, something like Michael, what, what, what I mean, you said about, you know, and, and, you know what, what you guys were talking about, adolescence yeah. love, and, you know, I think there's a, there's a, there's a wonderful line in um, Swimming with Sharks, you know, that... Um, uh, like Kevin Spacey says, uh, you know, you young people, he says, you know, just because you want something too much, you think you're going to get it, you know? And this is exactly, it, it, this, uh, and that is adolescence. You think, because I'm in love, I am going to be happy, I'm going to marry Simon and, you know, live happily ever after. It doesn't work out that way. And this is a film that's basically saying, you know, it, it is not going to probably work out that way. You're not going to find your, the love of your life when you're 18, but you learn from it, you grow from it. Well, and that there's other aspects of life, you know, that, and again, that capacity to experience love, to feel connected to people in your life is, is of paramount importance. We have a question over here, stage left, right at the front. Uh, yes, uh, well, sorry to disappoint you, but I really love the movie, so, um, but uh, I guess, well, first of all, this movie confirmed for me uh, something I already suspected that Romola, Gary, and Rose Byrne are two of our finest cool. actresses. But um, beyond that, why was this movie rated R? I understand there's nudity, but um, Diving Bell and the Butterfly had more nudity in this than that, and you got a PG-13. And I just think that's pretty, Nipples. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really unfair and sort of... You know what? Maybe sometime at Averfest we can have a whole panel discussion about the insanity of the MPAA, and I will lead it. <laughs> have you seen the film? This is not. This film is not yet rated, by the way. I think you would find it. I highly recommend. We have another question here, stage left, right at the back. We're the ones back here applauding and agreeing with you. Thank you. Thank you. And the opening line of the movie, I don't really remember it, but it was something like it was such a beautiful memory. I needed to be suspect from the beginning. And that was the whole point here. She was so wise. And what was it they said? She was um, consciously naive. That was the movie. I loved it. Um, I'm very glad. By the way, um, one of the problems I have with the movie is that among fans of this book, the first line of the book 
is one of the most famous, you know, up there with last night I dreamt that I was at Manderley again and all of that, and, and they, it comes about five minutes into the movie, and so it's hard for me to, I, I like your point, I think it's a very good point, but the book begins with her saying, I'm sitting here in the kitchen sink writing, and I love that beginning, and um, so I wish they'd had the flashback a little later, but that's a good point. Balcony, lower level. Hi, I'm up here a little bit left of center. <laughs> This came out in 2003. What happened to this movie? Why did we see it in theaters? Or I don't remember it being released in theaters. What, what's its story as far as when it um, was released? Well, um, it was released by, it was a BBC film. Was BBC, and, and, and BBC at that time, um, this is before Film 4 also collapsed in 2000, and around the time, in fact, 2000, 2003. They were making very small films, and um, they didn't have the budget to Lisa, and they were making very small, um, very small for America, but you know, mid-size, uh, kind of small uh, for England. And they were being released uh, in England, and they were getting distribution here in certain. Um, I mean, these films, you can see that it's not an art film. You know, this is not going for the. This is not a festival film. You know, and but it's also not going to really win over. Um, your multiplex crowd either. So that it was it was getting a platform release in certain big cities in New York and Chicago and, and LA, uh, but uh, and then and then going out to DVD. It's still happening, you know. That the, the, these I hate to use the word middle brow, but you know these middle brow films, um, very good films, which are as I said, you know, I love this film. Getting small platform releases and then going on to DVD. Yeah, question. Uh, lower level back in the back. Hi, thank you. It was a delightful film. We really appreciate that. Um, maybe references to Pride and Prejudice, perhaps. I thought similarities. Any I think all roads go back to Pride and Prejudice, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the two sisters, one smart and you know arguably plainer, although possibly more beautiful in the long run. And the other one flashier and seemingly shallow, but actually having a big heart, just not a super intellectual, like Jane and Elizabeth, like definitely, definitely think that those components were there. And the impulse, I mean, one of the things about Jane Austen that I love is that, again, she's always concerns herself with the, the struggle between, you know, the struggle between dichotomies, like, you know, wit and sincerity, things like that. And, and this film looks at all that too. So I think that it's, it's probably these, anyone who has loved, who, who would be concerned with these topics loves Jane Austen, and so even if it's unintentional, you know, Austen themes, especially by prejudice, would probably creep into the work. I, I certainly saw, I agree with you that everything goes back to Jane Austen, but something else that I thought of was Little Women, because in Little Women, you've got Amy who says, I'm going, it's my responsibility as the pretty one to marry to take care of the family, and, and she has to struggle, and, and of course, Austen heroines always, you know, it's, it, it's all right for, uh, for them to happen to fall in love with somebody who's very wealthy, but when other people do it, you know, they're very sensitive. She's always very judgmental of that. You know, like Elizabeth's friend does that, and, and she's really snippy. Well, well there is the, uh, and, and, and like that, I mean, one of, the, one, of the, one of the sisters in Pride and Prejudice ends up having a really bad life, even though marrying into money as well. I mean, this, this is the, uh, doesn't, doesn't she? Am I thinking of sensitivity you're, you're, or? Sensibility. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of sensitivity. You're, you're actually thinking of. I think the thing of Mansfield Park is the one where she, where where she, she yes. ends up, she marries for what for money. She marries oh. that awful pudgy guy who only talks about his costume to the play, and then she um, ends up running off with somebody else. And, and the sense of sensibility as well. One of the sisters, you know, it's just a horrible, horrible life. I mean, she, you know, it's 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 hinted at. at least. I feel like the headline's going to be panel doesn't know their Austin. <laughs> I was just saying. We have a question. Ask me uh, about balls. We have a question on the lower level, just uh, left of stage left of center over here. Yes, um, yes. This is a film about love, and it's a film about sisters. But it seems to me more than anything else, and what makes it remarkable is that, as the first line of the book suggests, and as the quote back there suggests, it's a film about writing. The book is about writing a book. It's about observation. It's about passion, it's about writer's block, um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little, and it quotes Shakespeare a lot, for example, 
And that is the, the meaning of the title, by the way, in case anybody wonders. When she says, I capture the castle, she is, as a writer, trying to capture what she sees. Can you talk about her. writing instead of love? <laughs> because there are lots of movies about love, but most don't handle writing very well. Yeah, I, I actually love the, love that part of the movie, too. I thought um, it was great that Cassandra, you know, her, a lot of her sensibility comes from, I think, internal reflection, which she does because she is a writer, because she keeps a journal, she writes every day, and she, and there's that great sense, um, that great relationship she has with her father, which part of the bond is because they're both writers, you know, and they love to write, and I think that's why she feels so compelled to help her father to overcome the writer's block, because in a way she feels like she's blocked because he is blocked, you know? And I and then and I loved it, what she did in the end by you know putting him in the castle and throwing away the key you know so I, I just I just thought yes yeah so I I do think I do think that's sort of what made her wise is the fact that she she writes and she reflects instead of just you know think talking and thinking out loud although what's interesting about this film is if you think of, bringing back um, the Little Women reference you know we have Joe who's who's passionate to actually be a writer. And for this character, her expression is writing, but I, I just occurred to me, I think I have a problem with the fact that she doesn't want to actively be a writer. I mean, truly her actual only ambition seems to be to be loved and to be in love. Like there isn't that moment where she's like, I'm gonna have a career or write a book or publish something myself. Well, she thinks she wrote 120 something pages right, in, her, right. in her diary. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, maybe I have a problem with but I that. Think her, I think her actions show that her integrity as an artist and a writer is more important to her than if all she cared about was being loved, I think she might have run off with Simon and tried to make that work. So I think I think we got to give her credit for the fact, and I think Grace's point is a really important one, that the reason that she is so wise is that she takes the time to really think about what's going on around her and try to express how that feels to her. Now, when I said earlier that the, about the surprise ending in the book, the, the whole revelation about the fact that the father's book is actually a meaningful and important and um, artistically challenging book is, I think, handled beautifully in the book. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, uh, and in that respect, I was reminded of Wonder Boys, you know. Uh, uh, in, in, although in Wonder Boys, Michael Douglas is working on this ludicrously long novel that turns out to be nothing and then, you know, and, and, you know gets rid of it and then and then he starts writing about you know uh, at the end um, uh, in this case this is very similar in that well, to me at least uh, the fact that eventually he starts writing you know eventually he gets rid of it. it's not just the writer's block but it's the burden of life that he gets rid of it and then starts writing it turns out to be a success I think that, I mean when you were talking about the, uh, the, the, the um, surprise I thought you were actually referring to the, the fact that the guy, this guy is actually still a pretty good writer, you know? Yeah, well, I am, but that's handled really well. Yeah. And, and I thought um, the concept of the muse for the writer in this movie is interesting, where he thought he needed a muse yeah, as in a woman. You know, he thought he could only have a muse woman, and that's what he needed to invite to write. But like you it said... It helps when there's a woman. It always helps. Writing, but, I mean, you, you need a muse. Yes, but I'm just saying, like you said, it's because there's also a burden that he hasn't even realized that he has, that he needed to let go of that. So perhaps after that, his muse can be in many different forms, not just in the form of a woman, which kind of... Bit of a, no, bit of a you know what? Was Actually, though, th that's one of the other good things about this film, is that there's a male muse that lurks here, who's, who's a fetishized... I mean, really, the most fetishized sexual object in the film is that beautiful boy who works... Who works for that? All, those you know, all the Greek gods were into one. Right, and becomes a kept boy, a man at one point, you know? I mean, lovely. <laughs> balcony, balcony, little left of center, second level. Um, actually, I thought, too, I, I agree with everything that I've heard so far, except the part about, I do like the movie very much. I don't know if I love it, but I sure like it a lot. But I thought it was largely about the struggle of an artist to find a way to be supported and we don't have patrons so much anymore. There was a talk, there was a discussion last night about a movie that, it really, a wonderful movie, Synecdoche, that ha has had a hard time making some cash. And so I think this movie alluded to that, to the struggle of an artist to just survive in a world that doesn't really, I think, necessarily always appreciate or show their appreciation for art. And the other thing, for me, everything goes back to Shakespeare. And I saw some real strong, uh, con I don't know, uh, yeah, connections to, for instance, obviously, Midsummer Night's Dream. 
And I would like to hear, and of course, A loves B and B loves C and C loves D, and it goes around in a circle. So I, I would like to hear what, what your panel would, uh, if you could comment on that. Certainly, I, I think this, the scene around the fire uh, is, you know, it, it, one of the things that Shakespeare loved to do was to take everybody into the natural, natural world. And that kind of pagan ritual scene around the fire, uh, which was a transforming experience for the two of them, uh, I think is, is the kind of thing that perhaps you're thinking about. Everybody. Midsummer's Night Comedy, right? I mean, Midsummer's Night Comedy. I'm like, Midsummer's Night Sex Comedy? <laughs> You really did like this film, didn't you? <laughs> and, and there are elements of Lear as well, obviously. You know, yeah. with, the, with, the, with the old, with the dad who's supposedly dying, and, and you know, one of the one of the daughters has inherited his talent. The other one, his kind of madness and and, 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 and possible possibly malice. You know, obviously, there's not a third daughter, but there is. A, if you can, you can think about the third daughter as the as the little kid, harvest the rage. Well, and also, I, for me, just like everything goes back to Austin and Huckleberry Finn, everything goes back to The Tempest. And, you know, the idea of him as kind of a magician, I think, is, is also prevalent. In I want to mention one thing. The, um, this is it. Because when you, said, when you mentioned The Tempest, uh, I was just, you know, automatically I remembered, um, you know, the last scene of Shakespeare in Love. And, uh, yeah, um, when the trailer... Uh, this, and we're talking about trailers as being a part of the movie going experience now in the day, in the, in the, in the day, age of the internet, you know, because you, um, and uh, when the trailer for this came out, um, it was so badly cut that, uh, well, th this particular moment when she says, it was my first kiss, and it's without context, and I kept on laughing at it. I kept on, this is, it's very similar in the, to the Shakespeare and Love trailer when, when uh, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow goes, I am to marry Essex a week on Saturday. And, uh, and you're thinking, calm down with the accent, uh, you know, and, uh, but when you watch it now, it's such a lovely scene. It's gorgeous. But, you know, I, I just want to say that. Yeah, it, it came across as, uh, you know, as a, a sex comedy. Uh, any, anyone else have a comment? We have a, we have a question right here in the lower level towards the back in the center. Yes. <clears throat> this isn't is really a question, more of a thought. Um, I did really enjoy this film. I wasn't absolutely swept away with it, but one aspect that really came out to me were the characters. Um, these characters could have been so bland or so typical, especially, you know, the whole gender role, you know, aspect of this film. I mean, the women could have been really, you know, damsel in distress, I need a man so bad, and the men could have been these big, hulky, especially Neil, I think his name was, you know, it could have been really arrogant and dumb, but these characters were real people, especially the son, the young son. I mean, he only had two lines, but yet he was a character, which is something I really appreciated. And uh, that's one thing that really, really struck me in this film was how well the characters were played and written. And... Uh, I know the filmmaker isn't here, but I want to compliment her for or him. We will we will accept the compliment on his behalf. Just, but I, I'm so happy that you said that because I also want to mention um, Mark Lucas, who played the uh, Neil, and uh, I think he's a terrific actor. He hasn't really had the opportunities that we'd like to see him have. He was in Jane Austen book club, so everything goes back to Jane Austen, and he's been in uh, a couple of other movies. But I, I thought he was lovely in this. So he was very big in Buffy, fourth of season. Of <laughs> so, you know, you know these 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 Wigan fans, you know, uh, exactly. Um, obviously, unfortunately, he can't be here. Bill Nye, you know, I think we should maybe talk about Bill Nye's performance. There's something about Bill Nye. Um, I was recently watching Shaun of the Dead again, and uh, he's yeah, exactly. He's great in that film, and the the, the scene where he's uh, he comes to see Shaun uh, at at Dixon's. Uh, the, the electronic superstore, you know, and he's and he's trying to get out of it. Whether he's going to whether he's going to commit to coming, you know, over to dinner or, or lunch, whatever. And there's this thing that he does where he says, "Will you call me to see you?" And, you know, right at the end, it's like there's always in Bill Nye performances and this as well. There's he's hiding so much that you can see that it's. And then there are moments when just things explode, like here, obviously when when he pushes Ron the Gray away. And, I'm so glad you mentioned it. I want to say one thing about Bill Nye, which I would have said I think it was here, is that 
he's such a fascinating performer. He has literally an offbeat delivery. It is just a little bit off the usual beat that's really mesmerizing. And what is surprising to me as a critic and who goes to so many movies is that sometimes the most distinctive and idiosyncratic quality of an actor, the very thing that you would think would make it hard to play a variety of roles, works for him in a wide variety of roles. And yeah, he's played a zombie in Shaun of the Dead. He played that very shy guy in Girl from the Cafe. He was, of course, unforgettable as the rock star in Love Actually. And that same sort of slightly... I mean, notes, notes on the Scandal? Yes, Notes on the Scandal. Yeah, he was, right, Squid Head. Even with the CGI all over his face. You know, he just makes that one sort of slightly tremor, vocal tremor of himself, work perfectly in all of those different contexts. And I, I just love that about well, him. Well, I think that, I'm sorry, I think that that's sort of what distinguishes um, Brit, like strong British acting for me in general is that willingness to hold back, like that willingness also to listen as an actor and to wait. You know, there's, you never get that sense that they're, they're that they're just waiting till they're back, you know, they're saying their line again. Like, there's always this moment with him where what he's, exactly what you're saying, like, what he's not, what he's not putting out there is exactly what lives at the center of the scene. I think, uh, just on that note, you said that he's looked delivery, which is exactly what struck me. Like, there's just the way he, he pauses, and it's so natural, and it's sort of different every time he says something. Um, I think there was that line where he gets that check from the publisher, and then, or non-check, non and he looks and he says, um, there's a first time for everything. And such a normal, standalone line in movies. And the way he says it just so different. And it's just the way he plots it at just the right moments. You know, and I, and I think I see that in all his performances through all different movies that he's been in. Um, because you mentioned that, I just, you know, shout out to Roger, obviously, because he's going to like this. Uh, there's a first time for everything, for, for science fiction nerds uh, like me. You know, there's a first time for everything. is is very much a nine billion names of God reference for us, uh, Arthur C. Clarke's, and it's a fantastic short story. Should, I love that short story. That was the first science fiction short story I ever read. Exactly, overhead without any. Well, I'm not going to give it, but but it's got a very famous last sentence as well. So. Excellent. I highly recommend it. I think we've got time for one more comment. We have a question on the lower level at the centre and at the back here. Hi, um, I um, am presently uh, permeated with rudder blocks myself, so, um, but I'm not um, acting out um, the same way James did, um, so that's a good thing. Now with the butter knife, anyway. Um, anyway, um, when he uh, was commenting, or when he uh, was speaking with Cassandra, and uh, they were in the tower, and he was saying something to her, and he asked her a question, and she responded, I'm 18. What was that question? Do, does any, do any of you remember? Are you 17? Yeah. Are you 17? No. At the, no end. at the end, yeah, at the end. I'm, yeah, I'm trying no, to remember. Before he did was I disappoint dying. you? Did I, did I disappoint? Oh, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, did, I, did I disappoint you? Did I disappoint you? And, nice. she, and she said, I'm 18. I'm, she said I'm 18. I just um, wanted to say something about Cassandra, that she, um, even in her lies, she noticed them, and in her youth, and her adolescence, and she always came to truth, and that was really something about her that I recognized, that she saw the lies, and she corrected herself, and she always looked for truth. And that was really something in this young person. And um, I really applauded that. So, thank you. Well, thank you all so very much. It's been a pleasure.